The Checkpoint is presented by GM Pharma, the first international multinational pharmaceutical company in Georgia. GM Pharma, to serve those who need it most. Output in the South Caucasus boosted by the recovery in consumption and a strong pickup in exports is projected to rebound sharply in 2021, expanding 5.8%, with Georgia leading the region this year with a projected rebound of 8%. Georgia's recovery is expected to age down to 5.5% in 2022 and 5% in 2023, as macroeconomic support continues to be removed. World Bank recent report says. The South Caucasus countries and Georgia in particular are seeing a robust recovery from the shocks of 2020, supported by pickup in domestic demand and recovery among external partners, said Sebastian Molyneux, World Bank Regional Director for the South Caucasus. However, amid rising inflation and slowly recovering labor market outcomes, increasing the pace of vaccination remains a critical priority. Beyond this, a sustainable recovery will be one that is green, resilient and inclusive, reforming state-owned enterprises, improving human capital and promoting innovation and digital transformation can improve productivity while rebuilding economic buffers and preparing for the impact of climate change will make growth resilient. In 2022, regional growth in Europe and Central Asia is forecast to moderate to 3.4% as external and domestic demand stabilized and pandemic stimulus is withdrawn. The outlook remains highly uncertain given the continuation of the pandemic, especially in the context of unequal vaccine access and hesitancy. The regional recovery has been accompanied by a rapid acceleration of inflation and remains vulnerable to financial stress, which could be triggered by an abrupt tightening of external financial conditions or a sharp rise in a policy uncertainty geopolitical tensions, reads the report. The role of competition is important because it is associated with dynamism, incentivizes firms to innovate, forcing more efficient firms to enter and grow while facilitating the exit of less efficient ones, said Asli Demirgu Kunt, World Bank Chief Economist for Europe and Central Asia. In countries with more competitive markets and stronger policies that protect competition, reallocation towards more productive firms was even greater. You are watching The Checkpoints with Elena Kvangelashvili and myself. I'm Dav Jalagonia. You are, we are here to tell you more about business and economics. 10 p.m. sharp and we're ready to start. Leading representatives of the Estonian startup ecosystem visited Georgia. During the visit, meetings were held between the representatives of JITA, the embassies of Estonia and Israel. The purpose of these meetings was to identify both challenges that Georgian startups face and opportunities that angel investors may offer. I see a lot in Georgia that I saw 10 years ago when I came back to Europe and uh, co-founded the Estonian Angel uh, Investor uh, Network and the Estonian Venture Capital Association. Uh, there's a lot of exciting teams here doing very interesting things. Sort of, it, it gives another opportunity, I think, uh, for a second chance for the investors uh, from our region to really support some fantastic startups that are going to change the world. There's actually a couple we're looking at from the, there's a, I think a, a great development in the uh, Georgian startup scene by having the 500 startups uh, effort here. Uh, I think that's going to expose a lot of the local teams to international uh, investors, to international talent that they can recruit from. And there were two or three of the finalists uh, that we're considering, we're looking at. 
we started our collaboration with Georgia 2016 and uh, we have very good partners here. Our main aim is to, to develop a startup ecosystem and uh, what we can bring to Georgia is our knowledge in Estonia and our experiences in startup ecosystem development and uh, I am quite sure that uh, first to get investments for startups uh, as a, from private investors, you need very good uh, level of startups. And the, through, our, through our program, we help uh, startups to be investor ready. And um, to, we, we train them, we help them develop uh, good business models. And uh, I am quite sure that uh, this readiness uh, is coming and uh, very soon uh, Georgian investors uh, can also inv invest themselves to, to startups in Georgia. The main challenges uh, in uh, startups level uh, are that um, Georgia is um, uh, not yet uh, partner, part of European Union. It of course uh, makes uh, the home market very small, as Estonia is a smaller country than Georgia is, but as we are membership of the European Union, it gives our, our startups and companies uh, immediately this big market or, or Europe. Uh, so that, uh, of course, this um, is uh, quite challenging for startups uh, to be scalable and uh, to enter foreign markets. The main interest for me is to find whether there are startups who want to grow, who want to go abroad, who want to go global, and see if I can be of help to them. And what I'm actually looking for tonight is to uh, meet more of the people. So far, my experience is uh, really amazing. I think Georgian startups uh, are far more ready for global EU markets than they think themselves. And I think it's, they need to realize quite often that uh, actually in EU, especially in Estonia where I come from, we really need newcomers, we need, we need new people in startups. We can learn more about the world's most expensive startups in October issue 4 of Georgia. Nikolas Mezmariashvili is on a cover leading a great transformation of his company and breaking the 10-year sales record of apartments in a now in a row for the last two years. This and many more interesting insights are in a new issue for Georgia. Maria Madamia has worked on a teaser. To present the October edition of the world's leading business publication Forbes, I came to the AIM Quadrat showroom. The main topic of this edition is the great transformation of this company headed by Nicolas Smith Mariashvili, breaking the record of 10 years. Attracting unprecedented funding in AIM Quadrat is linked to the so-called Nicolas Smith Mariashvili effect. Most importantly, AIM Quadrat is the first company in the region to receive funding for a development project from the Asian Developed Bank. What what is the main signature approach, what are the project plans and what does the new stage in the history of uh, the company means? Read about it all in the cover story of Forbes Georgia, October edition. In the new October issue of Forbes, the world's leading business magazine, you will read Traditional Forbes ratings, 10 richest municipalities in Georgia, what do they spend taxpayers' money on? Georgia's most profitable banks, microfinance organizations and insurance companies the most expensive startups in the world, and under 30s who change the country and therefore the world. The analytics column in October was devoted to overcoming the educational crisis and the pandemic. What is the energy future of the country? David Narmania shares his opinions about renewable energies. Forbes Georgia talked to Gocha Shonia about the establishment of a new natural gas market in the country. Meanwhile, Eurocredit is becoming a fintech company. The process of digitization in a microfinance organization has been going on for a year. Mikhail Nonikashvili, the CEO of the company, answers our questions about his plans and perspectives. What does the digital revolution do for us? At the initiative of Irak Liberidze, a Georgian expert in the field, an artificial intelligence and robotics center has been set up at the UN. You can learn the details from the interview about the mission of the center and why it was created. That is not all, though. In the October issue, we also find out reasons for the double-digit economic growth of the Georgian economy. We also talk about the importance of transformation and progress and introduce you to the list of inhospitable countries. For many more insights into the business world, read Forbes Georgia. 
the October issue of Forbes Georgia, you can also read about the world's most profitable banks. We will provide you with the update assessment of Georgia's banking sector by Fitch Ratings. According to the most recent report, the pressure from the pandemic on the Georgian banking sector has reduced amid the strong economic growth, but uh, asset quality remains key to banks' credit profiles. The checkpoint sat down with Alona Grenenko, director at Fitch Ratings, for a short talk on the sector. Let's start with the um, overall assessment of uh, Georgia's banking sector. Could Fitch ratings say that uh, this sector uh, showed its uh, resilience in, in, the, in the tough times of, of pandemic? At the, onset, at the onset of the pandemic, as you know, the banks had to create over 1 billion of uh, preemptive reserves that um, should have helped them to, to create, um, like to, um, to preserve against any potential asset quality deterioration over the whole cycle of the crisis. And banks also offered credit holidays to all retail clients and to legal entities from, um, from sectors that were most affected by the COVID. So the uptake was really very high, up to 60% of total loans. And there was a pretty high risk that um, the bulk part of these loans could become, could become non-performing. But it didn't really happen. And we see that the majority of borrowers have returned to, to regular loan repayments. And now, thanks to high economic growth, the improved business activity, um, the bank's profitability is, is now back to the pre-pandemic levels. So overall, um, we can say that the impact of the health crisis on Georgian, on Georgian banks was really lower than we initially expected. I remember uh, Alyona um, Fitch Ratings calling um, NBG's uh, decision to preemptively create these uh, buffers for banks, quite a unique uh, decision. How that looks from this perspective, was it, uh, was it the right decision to do so? Uh, well, it was indeed a unique decision because in other in other banking sectors we th we saw that the regulators were on the contrast um, introducing some forbearance on creation of reserves to help banks um, cope with the challenges of, of the crisis. But now we see that um, probably that was um, a good move as the banks created this one of lumpy reserves in March 2020. And uh, um, in the consequent period, the uh, additional loan impairment charges were pretty limited. Um, and ba some banks even, they, um, they recovered some of the provision previously created because of the uh, good performance of the loans. So yeah, mm -hmm. that was probably a good move. Yeah, and also, can we say on the on the Georgia's banking sector's side now that uh, this decision worked because uh, banks were in a good shape, so to say, and they could uh, meet this uh, this regulation. Yeah, they could meet this regulation because thanks to the implementation of Basel III um, capital requirements, the uh, uh, the Georgian banks really build up quite sizable capital buffers. And and at the onset of the crisis, when they created these one-off reserves, the bank's um, capital levels, they dropped. Um, but at the same time, um, the National Bank eased some, um, some capital requirements, namely the capital conservation buffer was eliminated completely. The CICR buffer was reduced by two thirds. So overall, the, the banks like headroom above the minimum uh, requirements remained pretty reasonable. And overall, their capital metrics remained quite um, quite uh, quite adequate, I would say. Let me read out one very interesting quote from the uh, from the from the report, the recent report. We believe that downside risks to asset quality remain and are contingent on the direction of the health crisis, while the performance of the restructured exposures remains highly dependent on the path of economic recovery, in particular in tourism and related sectors. Please elaborate a little bit uh, bit on this. 
during the pandemic in 2020, we saw an increase in sector NPLs, uh, which is of course explained by the uh, the slowdown of the of the economic growth, by the depreciation of LARI, uh, by the lockdowns. Um, but now this year, from the second quarter, we already see um, that the NPLs have started to reduce. Um, However, we, we do see still some downside risks here. So um, first of all, uh, unfortunately, the, the health crisis is not over yet. And in case of some further quarantine measures or lockdowns, banks might have to offer some additional credit holidays to borrowers, which could uh, potentially lead to an increase in restructured loans. And if this is coupled with lorry depreciation, that could make things even worse because of high lending dollarization, which is now above 50%. But even if um, the situation with the health crisis improves, we still need to watch uh, very carefully the performance of the, of the loans restructured during the pandemic. So according to, to various estimates, the share of restructured loans in the sector is about 20%. And um, the bulk part of restructurings was performed in sectors that were most vulnerable to the pandemic, um, such as the tourism related ones, such as the some real estate developments and some 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 other ones um so we need we really need to watch how these particular segments uh, recover from the crisis when the tourism revenues will be back to the pre-pandemic levels um, that would be cru crucial for the performance of these restructured loans so um to summarize, we think that the asset quality risks are still there and we really need to watch them pretty closely. A high lending dollarization, you mentioned this and uh, we can read in the report that this also makes banks borrowers vulnerable to local currency fluctuations. Reduction of dollarization in the system is likely to be a lengthy process requiring availability of long-term LARI uh, funding. What do you mean under a lengthy uh, process and do you think NBG should uh, take uh, further steps in, in this uh, direction? I mean, further um, active steps to, to curb polarization, um, also considering that we are still in, in, in pandemic. So answering the first part of your question. So by the lengthy process, we mean that um, the process of de-dollarization will take time because the key driver for high lending dollarization is the high share of dollar funding and lack of long-term funding in the local currency. And as the main source of funding for Georgian banks is customer deposits, and about 60% of them are denominated in dollars, uh, most of them attract from the individuals and as we know the population still prefers to make savings in dollars largely due to the um, track record of larry volatility and uh, periods of high inflation so in order to build up trust in the local currency um, really uh, we think that an extended track record of, uh, of stable larry uh, and the flow inflation will be required and it, it takes time second Part of my question is yeah. whether or not NBG should take further active steps to curb this dollarization considering the context of pandemic. First of all, uh, we should mention that a number of important macroprudential measures have already been introduced and it really bears fruit and we see it. So in 2019, the responsible lending regulation was introduced, as you know, uh, when the uh, PDIs and LTV limits were, were imposed uh, for loans to households. And these are different for, for, Lari, for, for Lari loans and for foreign currency loans. And in foreign currency, the restrictions are tighter so that borrowers could sustain some further depreciation of Lari. Also, the, as you know, this 200,000 yes, um, Lari floor. Yes, yeah, Larization posts. Yeah, and in retail, we see that the dollarization really decreased and now it's 40%. 
So, however, this, this, this issue with the availability of long-term lorry funding, it still remains an obstacle uh, to, to, like, to, to, to continue with de-dollarizing the banking sector. Um, the recent creation of pension fund um, is a good initiative. Also, some recent changes of um, reserve requirements. So they might help to further increase the volume of, of flurry funding in the system. Um, probably a development of the local capital markets could also be, be helpful. But um, these are the things that are, that are still yet to be achieved. Yes, this is a lengthy process indeed. Um, how would you um, explain, and you mentioned this uh, strong profitability of Georgia's banking uh, sector, uh, what, what explains this strong profitability in the times of pandemic? The performance of Georgian banks in 2020 was really undermined by this one-off provisions created in March 2020. Um, and actually, the sector in 2020 was barely break-even. Um, however, if we look on a pre-impairment basis, uh, before this sizable one-off reserves, uh, the, the decline in profitability was pretty low, um, as we see a marginal decrease in net interest income and net fee income declined by about 10%. Um, so... There is a number of reasons behind the uh, the rapid good return to uh, to good pr to to good uh, performance this year, and uh, probably the main one is the asset quality resilience. So the uh, um, the immediate pressures on the borrowers at during the pandemic were somewhat eased by the direct support of the state, and we estimate it was equal to about eight percent of GDP, and also of course the that relief measures offered by Georgian banks, these credit holidays, um, it, it, it all helped to like um, to reduce the um, the borrowers um, like pressures on the borrowers during the health crisis. Um, the strong economic growth uh, also supported banks' revenues generation capacity this year, as we see a rise in, in fee incomes, uh, an increase in business activity, higher credit demand, and it all supports um, good uh, performance and profitability prospects for, for Georgian banks. On the other hand, we can say that uh, um, new, new lending is, is limited, right? I would say that lending, new lending, it indeed moderated and um, so there are several reasons behind that uh, not just the pandemic the tighter regulations in in the retail segment maybe is a first and uh, quite important driver for for lower credit growth um, and uh, the second one is probably the already high indebtedness on all of the corporate segment um, it's uh, the, the overall this sector corporate debt is equal to about 70 percent of GDP and about half of that is sourced from from externally um, but that mainly relates really to like larger corporate borrowers um, to a less extent to SMEs so at this stage we probably should expect uh, the main driver for credit growth in the future to be the SMEs and the micro segments as they should compensate the, the Georgian banks for the narrowing margins because of higher or of lower growth in retail. We believe that the banks, um, they really have quite prudent underwriting practices and they watch the financial conditions of the borrowers pretty closely. So we should not expect banks to, to offer credit to SMEs where the leverage is already pretty high. Um, also, as a credit risk mitigator, um, there are still some credit guarantees offered by the state uh, for SMEs. So it's really, it, it should also like um, help and support growth in SME segment. Credit in, in Larry today is uh, uh, more expensive because of the tighter monetary uh, policy, right? So is that, uh, is that a factor as well? The, the lending to SMEs and micro is both in, in Lari and in, in foreign currency because uh, due to the high 
uh, like dollarization of funding, banks still need to issue uh, loans in foreign currencies. So that is not just in uh, only in Lari. What does the fact that you have highlighted in the uh, recent report that uh, lending penetration has uh, more than doubled uh, in the past um, decade and is now above our uh, peers in the region, um, uh, say about Georgia's lending environment in general and Georgia's uh, banking uh, sector? basically says that the um, Georgian banking sector has been developing very actively over the past decades and that the economic growth was pretty high, resulting in, uh, in rapid uh, credit growth. Um, that was particularly fast in, uh, in retail, and which is why the National Bank issued and introduced certain measures uh, to curb uh, higher, higher growth in retail. So I would say that high lending penetration effectively means that lending growth is likely to slow down in the medium, in the medium term. And we expect that it should be uh, more aligned with the nominal growth of the GDP in the country. From this, from the credit perspective, probably it is a positive thing. Um, from the economic from the growth perspective? Um, it's, it's normal when, uh, when the credit growth is in line with the nominal GDP growth. From the profitability perspective, um, maybe the, uh, the banks will not report like excessive revenues or excessive profits um, because of uh, lower growth in retail, lower growth in very high margin. Uh, segments, but we still expect the banks to report quite strong double-digit uh, return on average equity. When can we start about the post-pandemic uh, period for, for Georgia's banks, or has it already come, or <laughs> what is yeah. the perspective in, in, that, in that direction? Yeah, I hope I could answer that. It is already <laughs> there, but um, unfortunately, it will really depend on the further part of the health crisis. The National Bank announced that they expect uh, Georgian banks to return to the pre-pandemic uh, capital levels already in, in 2022. Yeah, so maybe that would be the period when we can say that things have returned back to normal and the post-pandemic period is now here. This is not the only interview in the Checkpoint. David, tell us what was the focus of your talk with David Narmani, chairman of Georgian National Energy and Water Supply Regulatory Commission. One thing that we heard this week was that the commission will review the consumer tariff this year. Yeah, you are right, Elena. As Narmani explains, tariff review is conditioned due to the separation of electricity distribution and supply activity. Uh, sorry for um, interruption, David, but to make it clear, now company Telmico supplies Tbilisi with electricity instead of Telasi, while EPI Georgia supplies the regions instead of Energopro Georgia, right? Absolutely right, David Narmani assures us that a substantial increase in a tariff is not expected as the current tariff already reflects all the key factors as electricity tariff has already increased since 1st January this year. Uh, of course, this is the, not the only topic covered during an interview with David Narmanian. Take a look. Thank you for your time for taking our questions. Let's start our interview with tariff policy. New tariffs for households in a gas sector have already been approved. How long will the government be able to maintain the price of gas for our population? The oil and gas corporation decided to help the household sector, and this is quite a heavy pressure for the corporation because it uses its own profit to maintain tariffs and pays almost 200 million gel per year for it. That's why we have a lower price of gas for the population. One cubic meter costs 56 tetra for households in regions and we have almost the same price in Tbilisi. Without subsidies coming from the corporations, the gas price would be much higher for us. Let's see how long the government can help the population.
The Oil and Gas Corporation writes in its 10-year development plan for the Georgian Gas Transmission Network that the policy of subsidies of gas tariffs might cause an obstacle for the infrastructure projects in the future. In terms of economy development, is it reasonable to take this risk from the government? If you ask me as an economist and the head of the regulatory commission as well, my answer is that we need to focus more on the economy components than the social support components step by step. The economic projects planned by the oil and gas corporation should not be delayed. I understand that there is still a pandemic which is accompanied by social difficulties, but I think that it will not last for years, and as soon as the social environment is improved, Proved. The oil and gas corporation should be allowed to implement its economic projects, and this is up to the government. As far as I know, this policy remains unchanged during the pandemic. Do you expect any changes in terms of electricity tariffs due to the division of energy supply companies' functions? Are there any circumstances that may allow energy companies to ask you for a tariff review? We have approved all the rules, including the tariff calculation rule and the tariff methodology according to the conjecture of this new market. Whatever we have, we do not expect any substantial growth. According to the methodology, the companies will apply to us six months ahead to set the tariffs. After the period expires, traditionally the tariffs will be set at the end of the period or in December. We have such a picture. On the one hand, our country is a member of the European Energy Community. We are implementing reforms. We have already passed the law and we even will already have a smart electricity metering. But this matter must measure the electricity consumption, which is great gradually becoming difficult to produce in this country, I mean the construction of new hydropower plants. Considering that we are a member of the European energy family, do you think that the challenges faced by investors in the energy sector of Georgia are quite serious? The current situation regarding the planning and construction of new facilities is unfavorable especially based on the already known decision made by the investor of Namakwani hydropower plant Enka. I hope that this is not the final decision and at least some consensus will be found with this or with another investor. It would be better to complete the ongoing facilitation process with the involvement of the European energy community and bring the members of this process closer together. There was additional research that needed to be completed and it would probably be better if the investor made the decision later because these types of decisions are assigned to other investors as well. Today not only the construction of Namakwani hydropower plant has been delayed but also the construction of other large and medium plants, including those projects that have practically no significant negative impact on the environment. Such a very radical protest against hydropower plants is not appropriate for our economy and security as well. Energy dependence is growing on many countries, including Russia, which has occupied 20% of our country's territory. Do we want an energy dependence in Russia? Probably not. Tariffs are important for doing business, and the business we will be showcasing now has a long history of doing business. This is GM Pharma. Its first medicine was produced in Georgia for the Georgian market in the year 2000. Today, it's the largest pharmaceutical producer company in the whole South Caucasus, with its branches in five CIS countries. Salome Chipashvili will show us more. I am Levan Varduashvili, GM Pharma Development and Marketing Director. The idea of creating this enterprise came around in the middle of 90s when foreign pharmaceutical companies were entering the Georgian pharmaceutical market and starting meetings with importing companies, those that distributed pharmaceutical products to Georgia. By that time, our founder, Mr. Kaha Okriashvili, had already founded 
one successful company. The date of establishment of the enterprise is considered to be the year 2000. Currently, the company is a multinational, international pharmaceutical company whose medicines are produced not only in Georgia, but in GMP certified enterprises in Western European countries. In February 2000, the first drug was released on the Georgian pharmaceutical market and it was the antibiotic rifampicin. The initial investment that was made to build this enterprise in 1999-2002 was 5 million US dollars. GM Pharma's manufacturing site in Tbilisi is the largest pharmaceutical plant in the South Caucasus region with a full cycle of pharmaceutical production. Accordingly, our enterprise is focused on the production of oral solid forms. Oral solid forms include medicines in capsules, tablets and dose powders in sachets. The main processes in the factory are dispensing, mixing, granulation, tableting, encapsulation, coating, as well as packaging, primary and secondary, and quality control at any stage of production. GM Pharma has a wide range of portfolio. As I have already mentioned, we have 264 different forms of released drugs, which cover practically all fields of medicine. In general, the success of GM Pharma is determined by three components, human resources, the technologies, and the processes that enable the better use of our human resources and technologies. When it comes to human resources, we believe our employees are the company's greatest asset. The most important thing is to hire the right staff for the right position. This in itself implies that the organizational structure is being adapted. A great deal of emphasis is being placed on raising the individual qualifications of employees. We have already started recruiting staff for key positions from abroad. This is especially true for research and development and quality control. We are especially proud that in 2020, the Swiss Rating Association awarded us the leader of the year award among the pharmaceutical companies. We are the companies that spend the most on employees in various areas in terms of salaries, other benefits or training. This is especially important because 2020 was a particularly difficult year given the COVID reality when companies were reducing the number of employees, when companies were reducing the salaries of employees, our company increased the overage salary by 15% for 700 employees. In total, GM Pharma has more than 800 employees of which 225 are employees in our export markets, international markets. The company currently has own representative offices in five CIS countries. These are Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Armenia and Moldova. We will have a representative office in Belarus and uh, we will open a branch there quite soon. We are practically in the last stage of the procedure of hiring the head of the representation. Only a few candidates to select from are left. We plan to open a representative office in Ukraine next year. We also plan to open a branch in Kazakhstan in 2023. We also take the first steps in Europe. We plan to operate in Latvia in 2023. By 2024, we plan to register and operate in Western and Central European countries with the help of our partners. Our export sales are outstanding. We're growing by an average of about 20% every year, and we plan to increase our exports by about 30% every year for the next five years. The forecast in this year for the export sales will be 36 million US dollars. We will agree that this is not a small figure for any. Georgian company. The ultimate goal is to export 100 million US dollars worth of products in 
2025. The company was founded in 2000. We are now 21 years old. 20 years is not a little time, not only for Georgian companies. It turns out that Compaq, a world-renowned company that manufactured personal laptops, existed for a total 20 years before it was sold to HP. For some time, the name of the Compaq was given to some notebooks, but since 2013, this name vanished. You may remember that there was a company as Vertu, which manufactured expensive mobile phones, but only existed for 17 years. It was shut down in 2019. Consequently, 20 years is not a little time for any company at all. We are proud that our company has reached this milestone and turned 21 years old. It is not just about making it to 21 years. We believe that this past period was very meaningful and value-added. The main goal of management is that the company remains meaningful, useful, beneficial. First of all for patients, society, company, employees, the state, business environment and healthcare sector. As I said, GM Pharma with its products and the economic wealth it has created is changing the quality of life of patients for the better as well adds value to the business environment and healthcare sector. I hope that together we will celebrate the 30s, 40s, 50s anniversary of GM Pharma with this pace of development. And last but not the least uh, story that we have to offer today is the story of Lisi Lake, a small and beautiful lake just near Tbilisi that is ideal for weekend getaways for anyone who enjoys the outdoors and a healthy lifestyle. However, it has a problem, not a new one, but today it is getting quite visible. The lake is drying up. Our reporter Natia Taktakishvili tried to sum up the reasons and solutions. So take a look. Lisi Lake is shrinking and water level is down by two meters. Where fish used to swim, there is now a rocky shore. This is not the first case when Lisi Lake is facing dry up. The problem was created to the lake in the 1990s. Bit by bit, the lake began to retreat. As the lake shrank, the area became less accommodating and the vegetation and fish died off. The environmental expert Nina Chobadza declares that in the 1990s, the problem was very acute as water level in Lisi Lake was down to 20 centimeters, but they managed to save the lake with the engagement of Tbilisi City Hall and environmental experts. Nina Chobadze noted that then they set up a special commission which made a relevant conclusion within a month and found the water source. According to her, Lisi Lake began to recover soon and reached 18 centimeters by the spring of the next year. Nina Chobadze notes that now the lake face is drying up because of the chaotic construction and damaged water channels. According to her, Tbilisi City Hall, as well as developers and Ministry of Environment Protection and Agriculture, must be engaged in the recovery process of Lisi Lake. As Chobadze notes, it does not need much financial resource. Active construction is carried out at the nearby area of Lisi Lake. Price of residential real estate is quite high because those buildings are located close to the lake. I think developers must be interested to invest money and save the lake. The first thing that needs to be done is setting up a commission which will include state structures as well. I want to note that this is not related to the large financial expenditures. The commission will evaluate the current condition, after which they make a conclusion and write an action plan. The checkpoint spoke to Rama Zahledyani, head of Lisi Lake Tourism and Recreation Complex. He noted that in the 1990s the company managed to save the lake as they found groundwater on the Nutsubidze Plateau 4. We found groundwater on Nutsubidze Plateau 4, where we set up a pumping station with a 3 km water pipe. So Lisi Lake received about 500 cubic meters of water per day, and as a result, the water in the lake returned to the old level. As Ramazah Lediani notes, Lisi Lake Tourism and Recreation Complex received the license for water use in 1999. 
but later license was suspended due to the amendments made to the legislation. Finally, in 2020, the dispute ended in favor of the company Abad Ahlodiani to cover the lake with an old problem, as the lake is still shrinking. We set up a ground and conducted a research. As of today, we have already submitted our studies to the Ministry of Environment. These studies show how we can return the water to the old level. Now we are waiting an answer from the Ministry of Environment Protection. According to the Ministry of Environment Protection and Agriculture, the agency will start to work on the problem if Tbilisi City Hall applies to the ministry, but the city government has not done it yet. On the other hand, Tbilisi City Hall declares that the city government is going to conduct a hydrological survey and find the historical water source which supplied the lake. The city hall will also examine the condition of old water channels. If they are damaged, alternative sources will be found. Until experts, government agencies and private business decide how to save the lake, Tbilisi citizens and its guests can lose an important recreation zone, which should be equal of the tragedy. Well, that's all for today. We will meet you on Sunday next week. Yes, 10 p.m. sharp, definitely. Before that, follow us on Forbes G and BMG until Sunday. And of course, we will leave you off with a beautiful feature from Guillaume Moulart. Enjoy. Last time we spoke about wine, September is the best month for harvesting. And in Georgia, the birthplace of wine, this process called Hrdveli is a real institution throughout the country. But did you know that among all those grapes varieties, there is almost no cultivable field of table grapes in Georgia? Mostly, the importations are still coming from the neighbor country, Armenia. Last year, Jacques Fleury, a French investor established in Georgia for more than 25 years and who we met previously together, has decided to change the agricultural landscape and started a huge project of table grapes plantation in Sartitschala, 30 minutes right from the capital city, Tbilisi. This is, this is basically the transfer of the highest technology in the world in uh, the production of table grapes. First, these are, uh, here we have four new varieties. Two of them are seedless, which are very demanded by certain markets. Uh, this is, for instance, uh, a variety called Regal, uh, white seedless. And uh, the characteristic is the speed of production. These plants have been planted in April 2020, so 15 months ago, and you already have a very big uh, uh, production, so it's very fast in, uh, in, in production. It's an investment per hectare, which is about 10 times more than anybody else is doing in, in the traditional, uh, let's say, plantation of grapes in, in, in Georgia. We are talking of 35,000 euro per per hectare investment. Uh, it's basically uh, based on the best uh, area of production of grapes in, in the world, which is uh, a, a province of Italy called Puglia, uh, the city of Bari. And uh, we are basically resting on, on this technology. And uh, we are, I think we are bringing a revolution in, in, in this market in, in Georgia. The quality of the grapes is, is exceptional in, in the sense that it's not watery, it's very firm. Practically, you can, you can cut like an apple uh, in, in four pieces your grapes, there is no, uh, no water. It's also very sweet. And I think we, the area here, due to the climate and the soil, we found out this is a very exceptional. We have only in Puglia, in Italy, we have this quality. If you buy the same, the same variety from Sicilia, the quality would not be. And I think here we are reaching the level of quality which is top of the world in, in this type. And this is the first year. So uh, after the second year or the third year, we, we will improve very much. 
maybe reduce the production to have bigger, uh, bigger grapes. Uh, but this is this is already a very, for the first year, it's a very promising uh, um, realization for Georgia. Uh, it's extraordinary in a country which is producing so much grapes. You still have 2,000 of uh, 2,000 ton per year of grapes imported from uh, table grapes imported from Armenia or Azerbaijan. So uh, we we intend to replace this, uh, these grapes. And we intend to even, I mean, even we, this quality is much, much better than whatever uh, Armenia is producing at the time. In Georgia, maybe some people are starting to, to introduce this variety. Also, it's, the, it's a great revolution in, in the 20, 21st century uh, in the consumer market is seedless grapes. You don't, you don't, have, a, you don't have seeds it, and it's also very firm. So it's a different, totally different grape, but you, you have to test it to really understand what is the difference. It, this is the number one variety in Europe. It's called uh, Italian. It, it's a Muscat uh, variety. The perfume is, is, is fantastic, really. And uh, we reach here a quality. And the color also, uh, it, Italia is much better when it is yellow. Uh, you, you see a lot of Italia in, in Europe, which is green. Not, not, not as good and more watery. Again, this is a very firm uh, grape and this is the king of the 20th century, uh, the, the best, uh, let's say, uh, the best grape, the table grape the existing. And this, this was a variety created in Italy in uh, around 1920, 1930, which conquered the whole of European market. And it's what is very interesting it's giving very, very good result uh, here. Similar to where it was you know, initiated in, in the south of Italy. Yeah, well, I think for the, the first two years, we will concentrate on the, on the Georgian market, but as soon as we have more production that is necessitated by the, by the Georgian market, we will export. We, are, we have pos lo a lot of possibility of exports because these, these grapes, in all of uh, Russia and, and uh, Eastern Europe are, are basically imported from Italy or Spain. So we can compete with uh, similar quality, top quality. We decided to work with Italian uh, support. And from the beginning, we bring saplings from uh, Italy. The company name was Vinia. And then we find our consultant, Tonino, which is helping us. Uh, we have daily communication through internet, plus he is visiting us four or five times annually. And we hope that we can achieve good results. project is Georgian because it is uh, funded by Georgian government as well. Partly it is funded by um, European Union as well and with local team, with local people and with help of our European consultants and partners we think that we can achieve that goal and have best quality grapes with good price and in time. My work is advice every day <laughs> because uh, I have a farm, I have uh, my work, uh, main work is uh, to advise uh, farmers. Uh, when I came the first time, I, I don't believe that uh, we realize this, uh, this project because 30 hectares is, are too much. Uh, I know we have experience and uh, to follow 30, 30 hectares is very difficult. But now I, I am more uh, uh, confident. There is some, uh, something to do better, but uh, I saw that the workers are uh, uh, ready to understand and uh, make a good work. Italy is very different because we have uh, different soil. Our soil is calcareous soil 
is very uh, interesting to to grow the vineyard. This is a, uh, also a very famous red grape. You will see that in most of uh, the supermarkets and shops in the United States and, and Europe. It's called the Red Globe, very popular. It's a, a grape with seeds, but it's a rather a, a very big size. This year, it's, it, the size is quite, uh, is quite okay, but uh, I think next year, because this is the first year, but next year we will have a bigger, even bigger grape. Yes, th this is the key to the success of this uh, plantation, is uh, first hell protection. So we don't have any damage in case of hell. We had hell this year, but no, absolutely no damage. We have an hell net and uh, uh, there is a drip irrigation also and drip fat irrigation, fat irrigation. So this is the top of the technology of table grapes. As you saw it, Georgia is in perpetual evolution also in the agro-industrial sector and this might come from foreign investors eager to improve the Georgian market on a daily basis. The goal of that kind of project is to reduce the importations for sure, but also to improve the Georgian business climate. Bon appétit! The Checkpoint is presented by GM Pharma, the first international multinational pharmaceutical company in Georgia. GM Pharma, to serve those who need it most.